Good morning and welcome to Studio Time with Deb, the online version. Today we are going to talk about textures and I have a lot to show you. So there are so many ways to make textures. I started going through this and started looking and started thinking and some of them are really obvious. When you look at a piece, you can say, well, that one's been stamped or that one's been hammered or whatever. Some, however, are very difficult to dissect what's going on. They're much more nuanced and it, sometimes it's because there's layers of texture. Sometimes it's because there's an uncommon use of a common technique. And sometimes it's because it's from a tool or a pattern or something that's made by the artist's invention. It's not something that everybody does that's out there. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you a lot of slides. When I first set this up, I had over 300 slides. I, I'm not going to show you 300, don't get worried. Um, but I am going to show you a lot of slides and I'm going to go through them and they're not in any particular order. But what I did was to put them in a way that I can talk about what the different textures are. And let me tell you ahead of time that some of them I know what the textures are, some of them I don't. I can make a guess, but I don't know. And um, so we can talk about that and, and what the possibilities are for making textures. Why would you want to texture something? Well, it creates visual interest in a piece. It can often complement a stone or another element in the piece so that it gives the piece an overall feel. Um, it can be easier to care for. It can showcase the handmade quality of work. And it can create a contrast of imagery. So when you use multiple techniques, texture on texture or layered techniques, um, that creates real intrigue sometimes. People really have to study about how that was made, how that was done. Often you can use multiple textures where it's texture on texture or layered ones. And often you will see a highly polished element in the same piece and it creates a lot of visual tension. And I'll show you that where you've got a highly polished element versus a textured piece all together. So I'm gonna show you that and we'll talk about that too. I want to talk to you just for a minute about the downside of large, highly polished areas. And that is number one, they're harder to do. It is very difficult to get a highly polished area that looks absolutely beautiful. It's harder to maintain. The first time you touch it, you've got a fingerprint on it. So it's, it's more difficult to maintain than something that has a little bit of texture or, or some, something to it other than a polish. Um, often you will see a reflection in it rather than seeing the piece itself. And that is especially true if it's a, especially bad if it's a married metal piece. Sometimes even copper and silver, which the metals are very different in color, right? They're um, about as different as you can get in the metals. And if they're both highly polished, a lot of times what you see is the reflection and you can't tell them apart. So when I, um, when I got married, I made a wedding band out of green, yellow, and red gold. And when I highly polished it, you couldn't tell that there was any difference at all. It needed to be a little bit matte in order to see those color differences. So if you do any married metal techniques, uh, mokume or um, mixed metal patterns of whatever kind, having them be um, a little bit matte in finish or have a texture on them will showcase them a lot better. Texture is not an answer to badly finished metal. That is not okay. The materials have to be finished well prior to texturing. It has to be scratch free. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a texture with a scratch down the middle of it and nothing that you can do about it. So that's just, just saying that texture is not the easy way out. Texture is what we need to do, uh, or cleaning up is what we need to do prior to texturing, okay? So I'm going to go to slides now and I'm going to go through these and talk to you about um, what the techniques are. So this is the first slide and this is a ring, a small ring. It's uh, heat textured and fused. 
So this is a wire right here that's fused on the top of it. And this is heat textured. Now, heat texturing is different than reticulation. I'm gonna show you a little bit of difference. I'm not gonna go into detail on it. But heat texturing, one of the ways that you can tell is see this curled edge that's here and here. And then I'll show you, and actually you can see it really well right here. See how this edge curls over? That is indicative of heat texturing. Um, there you can see it even better. See how this, this folds over? That is very indicative of heat texturing. So heat texturing is where we take a piece of metal and we heat it from the outside until the surface melts. And it leaves often this very rough texture. Sometimes if the piece, if the metal has been in and out of the pickle several times and has a fine silver layer on top, sometimes you will see reticulation on a heat textured piece on a so this is a belt buckle that was made um, by a student years ago. And what I want you to look at is the textures that she left on here. So this has a hammer texture here on the outside and then a much finer hammer texture in here. But look at these, look how she achieved the elephant skin by doing the cross hatching and the little texture in here. And look at the ears. Now this is um, chased and repoussé but along with that, she chose to leave a lot of the textures because you could do chasing and repose and still have it be slick and smooth and, and that kind of thing. But the textures that she left made this really rich and especially that outside frame, it really gave it that, that rough, rugged, um, wild kind of feel to it. There's a better detail of the elephants and the cross hatching. This is Roger Rimmel, and I want you to look how it's textured down here, and then it fades into nothing. And then this is a visual texture. So this is gold that's been melted on there, gold dust that's been melted on there. This, I, my guess is, is a hammer texture, and the same with this, that it's a hammer texture or stamping. But see how it fades out? So he's got this where, it, and it's got a very slick ear wire, Right, so he's got this where it fades into something that's fairly cleaned off and here by all means it's slick and here it's slick. And the contrast is really nice and really showcases the gold. This is a piece that has been fold formed and textured in two ways. It has some stamping on it uh, and it probably isn't stamping, it's probably a hammer texture. So there's a hammer at uh, Harbor Freight, it's called a framing hammer, and it has these spikes on it. And um, if you take a ha uh, that framing hammer and, and um, hammer on the piece of metal, then I think that's what this was done, was with first with the framing hammer, then it was fold formed, and then it was heat textured. Look, it's got the heat down here where it's been buckled somewhat. And when you start layering the textures like that, the look that you get is really interesting. It's a lot more interesting than any one of them by themselves. It, uh, it just adds a lot of, of layers and, and visual interest to what's going on. These are Rogers again. The bottom pieces are reticulated. The top pieces are probably roller printed. I don't know that for a fact, but I, I'm pretty sure. And the middle pieces have the gold, the gold dust on them, gold dust melted, gold filings, I should say. So this is one where the textures transition and they transition at the fold, which is very interesting. So the top is, I think that framing hammer, it's got a middle texture, I'm not sure what it is, either stamping on top of the framing hammer or it could just be the framing hammer used in more direct ways. The bottom one is a cross peen hammer. So it's got that long, narrow face. They used it a diagonal, which accents the diagonal of the way the fold form works. The other thing that accents it, I want you to notice, is that it's got silver right here and right here, but Question. not here or here. Yeah? Question. On that one, do you think it was textured before or after? Oh, before, definitely. Yeah, it's very hard to texture when you've got um, a, a piece that's not flat. Not saying you can't do it, I'm just saying it, it gets much more difficult. 
So this one it would, was textured flat and then rolled around to make the bale and then fold formed and folded into place. This is a really interesting piece. So this is colored pencil and it's been riveted on. But I want you to look at the textures on here. This is heat textured. This is fold formed. This has stamping on it. This is also stamping, probably with a texture hammer, the one of the ones that has the big squares on it. So it's got texture hammer, fold formed, heat texture, and stamping. And the way it draws your eye, and then stamping also across here, a hammer texture across here. So the way it draws your eye across is really beautiful. And it's just, uh, it's, it's really an intriguing piece with a lot of richness because of the texture. Also notice the stamping on the, um, right here, on the colored pencil is really nice. Look at the more subtle texture right here. That's probably hammer textured. Uh, more of Rogers, I'm gonna make this bigger. Again, roller printed and the gold dust. This one, I'm not sure how he does these. This with the really coarse, you can do this with a really, really coarse uh, steel brush where you get this, this really rough texture on it. Um, you can also do it with really coarse steel wool or I have a, a pad that I like to do these with. And it's, uh, it's the pad, I buy them from the industrial place and they're used for cleaning griddles in restaurants. Uh, 3M makes them and they're very coarse and they will leave a texture like that. That's a really beautiful texture. This is corrugated and uh, you can see by the cross corrugations here, you can get some really interesting textures and patterns. This is a single corrugation, but I want you to look at the more subtle pattern that's under here that also has these itty bitty little lines. So that is probably raffia. If you take um, raffia, like the, the stuff that you uh, tie on the top of, of gifts, you know, the raffia uh, string basically, and you wrap it around a piece of metal, you can go front and back and put that through the mill, you will often get something that looks like this. Deb, it was actually corn husk. Is it corn husk? Yeah. That was my second guess, but I thought it was raffia because of the way it was, um, that's good to know. And this is yours, Janice? Janice, is this your piece? Yes, ma'am. I will label it. Thank you. Nice piece. Um, so, okay, corn husk it is. Corn husk I love. It's one of my favorites. These are earrings that are corrugated and the corrugation makes a really lovely pattern as it goes around. Nice texture. Borders on texture pattern. This one, look at the stamping that's under here, the underneath. I'm sure that was done with a texture hammer. And then the little stamping here on the sides, just a little, little bit, and it accents what's going on in the ring. There, you can see it a little bit better, especially you can see the outside ones. So this is a cuff bracelet and it's just basically panels of texture and there's all sorts of different texture. I, so I, again, I'm guessing, but I think all of these are hammer texture. It's just some is the framing hammer there. Um, one is a patterned hammer. One is a cross peen, uh, different ones and they're soldered together in layers. This is a bronze spoon and small plate and the hammer marks were left in and the hammer that was used to make it was um, a little bit rounder than it needed to be. And so what it did was to leave some pretty severe marks in it, but it left really beautiful marks because it left showing the handmade quality of the plate and the spoon itself. And the spoon itself, especially look at these edges. Look at this, where the, the, the bordering or the um, cross peen hammer was used to leave these marks right here and up, up into here. And it just gives it a really beautiful handmade quality. 
love that plate. I got to make one of those. This is holes used as texture. So a lot of times when we drill holes, especially when you drill them in patterns and that kind of thing, that, that makes a texture itself. The surface on this is something that could be made with that pad that I was talking about uh, or with a really coarse steel brush, either one. These are Connie Foxes. These, I don't know for sure if these are holes or if they were just stamps. I think they're holes. She did a lot with holes. And then this is etching, a light etching. Uh, could be roller printed too. Probably an etching. So, but etching is another way that you can make patterns and make texture. It's roller printed. Is it? Because I borrowed the plate from her. It's a Bonnie Dune plate. Oh, is it? Interesting. I'm sorry, it's not, yeah, it's a roller, it's a rolling plate. From yeah, usually I recognize the plates that are out there and I don't recognize that one. So that's- yeah, Bonnie Dune. Yeah. Okay, roller printed, good to know. So a uh, roller printed plate, and we'll talk about ones that are out there versus ones you make. This is Deb Karish. So these, I, these I believe are stamped all along the edge, although they could be. She also uses a really small burr and goes in there and makes lines with burrs. We'll talk about that too. This is another one from Connie. Okay, that's that same plate right there. That's it. Yep. This one is either stamped or with a cross peen hammer. The, so the cross peen hammer definitely on the wire, but the under plate is either a very, very fine cross peen hammer or a chisel like tool used to stamp to make that. This is Linda Greens. I'll, I'll show you a close up in a minute. So this isn't the best slide, but what I want you to notice on this is the stone right here and the pattern in the stone and how the pattern in the back plate complements it. There's a closer one of it. So I believe, Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is an etching. And the other thing yes, I want you is. to notice, okay, good, thanks. The other thing I want you to notice is the notches in here and how they also draw your eye across the stone and then into this pattern. So, and then this piece, I'm pretty sure is roller printed. Am I right on that, Linda? The bale up here? I think it is. She, either that or it's just scribed lines. She has, um, I remember I just scribed it with the sharp scribe. It's a piece of tubing. Okay. So I couldn't roller print it. It was, you know, purchased tubing. It was purchased tubing and then you scribed it. So we're gonna see yes. some more scribed lines and that goes beautifully with the, the lines that are down here and the lines in the stone. And you can see how that complements everything and complements the design. This is another Deb, Deb Karish one. And uh, again, she uses stamps and burrs and little punches. So this is stamped from the back to give it an embossed feel. Little stamping here. And look at the stamping in multiple directions too. Look at the stamping too. It goes this way, but look at this line that comes through here. It's really interesting in the way it draws your eye through there. This is another corrugated piece. Corrugation is a really fun texture and there's a lot you can do with it. I'm gonna show you more later. These are holes. So this has a piece underneath it. The underneath piece is bimetal. The top piece is sterling silver with holes in it. And so you're looking down through the holes into the gold. And you can see how the holes make a texture basically on the whole piece. This is Jane Adam. She does beautiful, beautiful work. So these are roller printed, but the middle one is also scribed and it is scribed deeply through bimetal so that you get the silver lines coming through the gold side 
um, so that she, she scribed all the way through it, which is really an interesting look, really a beautiful look. This is another one where the holes are serve as texture. And then again, the scribed lines, look at all those scribed lines and how they read as texture. The, um, so this is all bimetal. These are more of hers, bimetal scribed lines, and they're also roller printed. I think she's roller printing with paper. I don't know that for sure, but it looks like it because it's a that very subtle, soft, uh, but just got a slight texture to it. This is a steel and gold cuff. Um, at least that's what it said. I, I have trouble believing that steel, but that's what it said. Um, it's got what I believe to be stamping on it, although it could well be etched prior to putting the gold on. And the gold is left very rough on this. Um, so it serves as its own texture. And we'll talk more about fusing in just a little bit. This one has stamping. Another Deb Karish piece. This is, I'm sure, made with burrs because you don't get stamps that long, but um, nice little burrs. And then notice the hammer texture on the, the body right here, right here. That's not just reflection. That's a little bit of hammer texture. And that gives it a much more natural, um, um, kind of an organic, a natural butterfly sort of feel. If that was super slick, it wouldn't be, I don't know, it, it just wouldn't be as soft. It wouldn't be as nature as it is now. I don't know what this is. It's steel. Um, I think it is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and the hammer textures on it are just gorgeous. So this is forging that's been left, and I'm sure it's steel, and that it's just been left as hammer texture. Gorgeous piece. Charity. Charity uses a, a lot of chisel marks here. So there's chiseling going around here, and it goes all the way around the band, and then a little bit here on the top of this, and that also sets that stone. Um, that's a way to set that stone over is by chiseling the top of it like that. This is one, the bottom plate is uh, roller printed. And the way I can tell that is because if you look at the back of it right here, the part that's not the dots, the part that's not the dots has the paper showing, the paper print. And then the part that is the dots was probably where the paper had holes in it. And then these dots were punched from behind on that piece. So it's a nice combination of the two. Also notice the shiny versus the matte. That's kind of an interesting combo. This is a Sydney Lynch piece. So these marks are, I, my guess is um, that they are made with a checkering file and the same with the edge all along here that if you have a really coarse checkering file, you can get in there and make those marks um, pretty easily, pretty quickly. This is roller printed, both pieces, and both of them are screen. One is a very fine screen. The bottom one uh, is screen that's been distorted. So a lot of times um, I'll take screen and pull on it. I find that old aluminum screen, if I can get my hands on it, and uh, take it and pull on it and distort it and do all kinds of things when I do the print. And it makes some fun, interesting prints. This is gold filings that have been put in here. And then again, notice the, the hammer texture around the outside and notice around the band here. Okay. And that could be a stamp and it could be a bordering hammer or a, one of the really fine cross peen hammers. This is a sheet of corrugation that I wanted to show you because it's one that a student did. It was run through the corrugator at different, um, different sizes, different, uh, I don't know what you would call it, gauges. Uh, probably 
five or six different times going different directions. And this is what she ended up with. And it's a beautiful sheet. It's got a lot of rich texture to it and something that most people would look at that, you'd know it's corrugated, but you wouldn't have any clue how it was really done. These are nice, so subtle texture right here on the outside. And what I believe was done was that these sheets were textured prior to forming them. And so some of the texture softened a little bit as they got formed, the edges were left and then polished. And look at it again, the difference the the stark difference between those gold pieces that are polished and the back piece that has texture what it does is really make that gold pop it makes it really show this is another deb karish piece and again uh burr and probably some stamping but i'm not sure i think it's hammer texture around especially this ring around here one thing I want you to notice on this piece that it's subtle, but it's important is these two little marks right here and these three little marks right here. And if you look at it, it balances these two little rivets and these three little rivets so that you've got this and this and it makes your eye really travel here. You come around, you see this, you come back into here, you see this. It, just makes your eye travel really well. It's subtle, but it's, if you think about, if you look at this piece and you think about these marks and these marks not being there, it does diminish the piece some. It makes it not quite as rich as it is with those little marks there. Those little marks make your eye stop. They make you stop and look at what's going on. They make you, um, they make you see it a little bit differently. This is Monica's and I had to, to ask her how she did it. So there's roller print on here and then hammer texture. She said the middle one is that framing hammer that I was talking about, the Harbor Freight framing hammer. This one is subtle texture. So this is a meteorite piece, but look at this very subtle texture here. And that's done with uh, probably with a bordering hammer, but a bigger one, a wider faced cross peen hammer. And that also accents some of the design that's going on in the meteorite. And then also with these pieces that are the tabs that hold it in. This is just a sample piece, but I wanted to show it to you because it is a combination of a roller print with a heat texture. So it was first of all roller printed very, very deeply with screen and you can still see the screen somewhat through the heat texture, but the heat texture has distorted it and added to it. So you can see this, where the screen was printed here, but down here it kind of got destroyed and then up here I don't think it was printed at all. It just heat textured. Question Deb? Yeah. So why at the top of that is it not considered reticulation? So technically it probably is reticulation. Um, I'll get into it later, but reticulation is, uh, it, it's a very different thing than heat texturing. Heat texturing, we're melting the outside and reticulation, we're melting the inside without melting the outside. So it's actually completely backwards. Sometimes they look similar and sometimes when the heat texturing cools, it cools in ways that has the lines and whatnot like this, that have, and like this, so that it has a similar look to reticulation, but it's not the same because of the way it's done. The melting, when you melt the surface of the metal, the actual surface of the metal, that's not reticulation, um, that's heat texturing. So I'll go more into that. I, I, I got a little bit more of it here. I was thinking about doing a whole thing on it, but I, that might bore everybody to tears. I'm not sure. We'll see. This is fusing. So fusing is when we don't use any solder, but what we're going to do is to take the pieces of metal up to the place where just the surface melts. 
Now, in order to get successful fusing, I have to melt the surface of this one and this one at the same time so that they hook together. If I do just one of them, it won't hook together. I've got to do both of them. And in the process of doing that, I often get heat texture like this or like this. Sometimes I won't. Sometimes they'll stay flatter. But in this one, heat textured here, but not over in here. So this piece is fused. This is reticulation on red brass. Red brass is one of the materials that will reticulate really beautifully. What we do is that we bring up the copper surface and then by running the torch down it, we can melt the inside without melting the outside. So it's just the inside that melts, not the outside at all. The outside stays rigid. And because the outside stays rigid, it creates the, the linear pattern that you see. So you can look at this, you see exactly where the torch went, right? You can even tell which direction the torch was going. This is another one. This is red brass that's reticulated. And this is another one that's red brass that's reticulated. This one had a much larger flame and a more overlapping flame. So it's not a linear pattern like the others, but it's still got, it's, it still got that um, where the inside is melted and not the outside. The outside stayed rigid or as rigid as it could with the inside melted. So this is a combination of techniques. This one has a reticulated red brass piece. This is a heat, um, heat melted, not quite melted, almost, heat textured piece. And then these pieces back here, I'm gonna show you the back of it, are fused. Another Deb Karish piece. Again, notice the different textures. Deb, go back to, to the previous one. One more. So that's actually mine. And, oh, I'll label it. Um, so where it looks so gold, that's where I went on and burnished it down to the red brass. So it yeah. looks more gold-like. And it's beautiful. So yeah, after it's reticulated like that, you can go back down and get rid of the copper that's on the surface that you had on the surface in order to reticulate it. And um, yeah, get that gold color in it. It's really beautiful. And I what? love the way this complements this, complements this, really nice. What torch did you use? Sure, it was the acetylene class, um, just really hot on the brass at least. Yeah, you have to go really hot on that brass to reticulate it. Are those pieces soldered together or does it fuse somehow? They're fused. Okay. Right? You didn't solder any of those, right, Kathy? Well, you soldered the silver to the brass, but not this back piece, this is fused. Yes, that's all fused. Um, yeah, obviously, but, you have to solder some, but right. on the yeah. brass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Deb Karish. This is Anne, and I don't know how she does her textures. I would assume this is roller printed, but I'm not positive. This one to me looks scribed. See how, this, look at the scribe lines. And you can get a scribe, if you get a good sharp diamond scribe or a burr, a little itty bitty, itty bitty diamond burr, um, you can go in and make all sorts of wonderful designs on metal. You can draw with it. You can, um, you can do all kinds of playful things. And then notice the stamping on these pieces right here. How is it colored? Is it enamel? She's an enamelist, but I, I don't know. I, I, my guess is this is the enamel piece. My guess is this is liver of sulfur. Do you guys know how to do liver of sulfur so that you get colors if you want colors? Mix it up with coffee instead of water. These are Wendy's and these are skeleton leaves. You can order skeleton leaves online. You can get them in different sizes. 
And let me tell you, if you get the really ugly colors, they are cheap. Um, you get the really, the ones that are like this brilliant red or, you know, fuchsia or something really weird. Um, they are dirt cheap or the ones that fade from orange to red or who knows what. Anyway, they print beautifully. This is either hammer texture or stamping. Could be either one, depending on what you want to do and how you do it. Same with this one. These, I want you to notice that these are heat textured. This is gold in the back, they're heat textured. And this has a very light hammer texture to it. But the setting itself is highly polished. And even the hammer texture is relatively highly polished. So the contrast between having the gold be really rough and rugged and then the colors going together between the gold and the hessonite garnet and the, the line of silver drawing you down, it just makes a really nice contrast for the piece. This. So you guys know that when you forge and when you're, you're making something, you've got an anvil, you've got a hammer, and you've got your metal. So one of those things has to be the hardest thing. Um, preferably it's not your metal. Preferably your metal is the softest thing. So now you've got your anvil and your hammer and one of those has to be the hardest thing. My preference is that it's the hammer because if I miss the metal, I don't want the hammer to get dinged up. I want, if anything, the anvil's going to get dinged up. And that's okay because over time it just gets, it gets dinged a little and over time it just kind of has some small marks in it and it's okay. You don't want to make big marks, but you don't want to make any marks, but uh, over time it's going to get some hammer marks in it. To me, this piece looks like it was forged on an anvil that's a little bit rough and then the rough side, the, the part that was down, is the part that's on the outside and the inside is smooth where it was worked with the hammer and then cleaned up. So Sometimes you can think about texture when you leave the, the, the texture that's made from a rough anvil or a rough bench pin or a rough uh, bench block and leave that as your outside or even inside texture. This is Pam Cyril's piece and the bottom one I know is roller printed. And the top one, I, or the top ones, I am not positive. I would, um, I don't know. Pam, are you there? I don't think she's there. They could be roller printed and they could be etched. And that's kind of what I mean about texture. Sometimes it's nuanced. Sometimes you don't know. You can't tell right off how it was made, what was done. That creates a lot of interest in a piece. Kathy, this is Kathy's. So this is textured copper. And I'm going to show you the back of it. Most of you have seen this on the Facebook page. Copper does not heat up nicely. It does not like to, to heat texture, to melt, to whatever. It, um, it takes a lot of heat to do that. And often you can't even see what's going on. Um, the top side will still look just absolutely normal and you won't know that you've done anything until you pick it up and flip it over. So copper is really weird to handle um, and, and not real easy to handle. But you can see what a rich texture it makes. And then look at the heat textured silver on the top and the hammer textured wire. And notice too the contrast with those beautiful little silver balls that are the rivets. Those are, are they rivets or are they just balls? They're just balls. They're just balls. Yeah. So, but look at the contrast with that. So the little silver balls really shine and partly because they're on a textured surface. This is a Helen Shirk piece. 
And what I wanted to show you about this, this is, has, this is a roller printed piece right back here. But what I wanted to show you was that she took a piece of probably brass, although it could have been something else. Uh, I use aluminum in my studio. And she stamped this design into it, okay? But it was a small piece and she ran it through the mill with a piece of silver because it was a small piece she also has this border around it and it framed it so when she ran it through the the piece that she printed was smaller than the piece than the silver and it left that border on there that framed basically frames that roller print for her That's a fun way of making your, you can make your own plates. You can make them be whatever you want. This is another one. This one has holes here and here, the giant holes, the, the big thing here. And then notice too, the scratch brush finish, kind of a coarse finish on this. This is a Connie piece. It's got heat texture. It's got some roller print. It's got some stamping from the back and it's got fold forming. And I think it's got some hammer texture on it. This is another one. It's got scribed lines. It's got holes and roller print. This is reticulation and it's a reticulated piece. And then it's got a roller printed piece on the bottom that also has a little bit of stamping on it. Notice the gold bar that runs across the top. And again, how having that highly polished reflective metal against that texture really makes it stand out, really makes that pop. This is a bracelet. It has heat texture, well, holes drilled in it first and heat texture. It's got rivets used a lot as a texture. And then if you look at the back right here, that's a roller printed texture with the holes in it. This is uh, holes in the back, the, the main part of the bracelet and then a screen, a screen print. And you can see how the screen has been distorted. This is another one. This is holes with heat texture. So when you heat texture the holes, they often get distorted like this. They'll, they'll sometimes melt out, sometimes just round, uh, but they have a really interesting distortion. This is another one where the holes really got distorted. Some of them melted altogether. Uh, notice these edges that come in like this. That is indicative of heat texturing right here, all along here. This is one. So this texture you can get by roller printing, but you can also get this texture by going out and putting a piece of metal down on a sidewalk or something and hammering on the backside of it. If you, um, if you do that, you pick up the sidewalk or the rock or the whatever texture is that you're hammering on. It's kind of like hammering on a really nasty anvil, an anvil that's been abused a lot. And then notice the texture here, which is embossed. So that's stamped from the back. This is texture by holes. This again has holes. It also has the, the um, heat texture. This, Renee, is this your piece? Yes. Excellent. So this is Renee's and it is made by, it, it's got, it's wire scored, number one. Number two, it's um, got some holes in it that I want you to take note of. Number three, it was a plate that she made that was etched and it was double etched. It was etched one direction and then the other direction. 
So it's got just all sorts of really rich textures in it. Um, and the etching left a little bit of roughness and that printed. And so that is another texture that's on there uh, from, the, from the roller print plate that she had made. So on these, I want you to notice this is how the stone is set. So it's set because these little claws come and grab it from the back, grab this front plate from the back and hold that stone down. But, you know, it would have taken two claws really to hold it in place, uh, maybe three. But the way this is done, it, this, these little claws become a texture and they complement the texture that's going on here in the wire and over here. This is holes as a texture, and then they're stamping around the holes, and then the copper piece has, it looks like to me, stamping and um, hammer texture, both. This is etched. This is likely roller printed, could have been etched. This is reticulation. So reticulation does look very different. Once you know what the difference is in them, you can pretty much spot them right away. Um, this is reticulated and it's also using the gold balls as another texture, especially over in here. And then if you'll notice this line and actually all of these edges um, are textured. They're not, they're not, you can see it really well up here. And that again complements what's going on in the rest of the piece. This is a hammer texture, and this is a hammer texture from a hammer that I made. Uh, I like to make my own hammer textures. I like to do my own textures. I don't like ones typically that, um, that I can look at and say, oh, that comes from metalliferous and it's number 47 or whatever. Uh, I really like ones that I make that are my very own. And then this is a, it's a, cheap Harbor Freight hammer that I took a separating disc to and I made a lot of lines in. And depending on whether I hammer it uh, horizontally or vertically, um, or I should say in, in line with the wire or perpendicular to the wire, um, I get completely different textures on it. A little bit of stamping on this. I do want you to notice, look at these bales, guys. I, I didn't put this in the bale one and I just found it. I'm still going through slides. But look, these are hooks. Look at this. And they're forged right here. I think those are just gorgeous. So this is a sample piece from Fred Zweig and it's a chasing and repose piece. But when he formed this piece, he was using a hammer, obviously, that had marks on it. Look at that, or a chasing tool. Um, but it had the marks on it. See the marks that are on every one of them? Now he twisted and turned it and did other things and then went through and, and maybe lightly sanded or polished some of the high areas. And again, that contrast between this really highly polished and these edges that are polished and even these little itty bitty edges that are polished versus the texture that you've got in here just makes everything stand out really beautifully. And this is a sample, but you could do the same thing with a piece of jewelry or with a piece of hollowware. These are some more sample pieces from Fred. And again, look at the hammer marks on them. Hammer marks is texture. Again, notice these edges that are really crisp and polished up. And that just defines that shape. Look at this one, really nice. 
this is Chasing and Repose again. So in Chasing and Repose, one of the things that happens is a lot of times we use matting tools. And uh, matting tools are basically stamps that are made for Chasing and Repose. And they can give it an overall texture. So there's been right here and over in here at least. Some, that looks more like a stamp, but this looks more like a matting tool to me. Uh, David uh, Wang, Wang? Wang. He does these beautiful vessels. And um, they, the matting tools he uses are just phenomenal. This is a piece, this is a really interesting piece. Uh, this is an aluminum drain and it's got um, gold. Those are gold rivets that are in there. But again, look how it's used as texture and pattern as opposed to, um, I don't know, as opposed to design. It's texture and pattern. The holes are really texture in this. This one, um, I'm pretty sure is stamped. And this is another one by the same artist. So it's stamped and then pierced. And notice that the holes in the piercing create pattern and texture as well as the, the stamping. Here's a close up. This one also has some really coarse um, finish to it, either sanding or wire brush, something going on. This is Linda's piece, and I want you to notice several things about this. One is the little marks that are on the wire as it comes around. But the other one is this, and this is roller printed uh, rice paper. And it's a very open weave rice paper. Um, it's really a pretty piece, but uh, notice how this, not only the shape, but the texture in it complements the shape and the texture of the stone. Deb, I have a question on that piece about the soldering. Uh-huh. Where the top wire comes over with the curlicue, is that embedded in the outside wire or they did, is it on top, that right in there? How is that little joint done? It's set oh. like Lincoln logs used to be set. Each one is, is half notched through and they overlap. Awesome. That would have been my guess because trying to do that as separate pieces would have been a nightmare. But doing it as Lincoln logs where you file one direction and file the other direction and fit them together, then that creates something that's stable, but together like that. Yeah, nice job, Linda. And there you can see a little bit more of the wire especially. I like how there's that starburst on the one wire. Um, yes, right here. That complements that, um, the rutilated stone, rutilated quartz nicely. So these are heat textured silver and then gold that's actually been also heat textured. Um, many of you know the story about these earrings. These are some I made some years back. My, um, my sister, the, the middle one of the three of us girls, um, passed away several years ago. And um, she was very, very conservative in her jewelry. And so she had... Um, I always knew that I was best off if I just bought her something from Rio and didn't try to make her anything. Um, so she had a pair of gold, uh, 14 karat gold hoops and they had, they were just your basic hoops that had um, little lines on them, little etching, it wasn't etchings, but little, little lines. And um, the kids didn't want them. And I bought the jewelry that, that they didn't want, figuring I could scrap it and they didn't, wouldn't, they would take it to somebody who would pay them pennies. Um, so I had them and I would never wear them and I knew that. And so I figured I was just going to send them into the scrap anyway. And I figured that, uh, I was going to try to play with them first. So what I did was to take, and they're hollow of course, right? Cause they would, they weigh nothing. So I took these hollow hoops and I opened them up. So they, they, and when I opened them up, of course they 
crinkled and crunched and, and distorted. And then I laid them down. So there's, there's, this is part of the gold hoop. And then this is another part of it. And if you look, see these little lines, you can see still the markings in there. You can see where the, those lines were. And you can also see, see down here where the tube melted and here it melted. Here you can see that it's tube and there you can see it's tube. You can see some more of the lines right here. You can see some of them over here. So then what I did was to fuse those pieces together and then I soldered them onto the silver. I love these earrings. I think they are just wonderful. And probably a lot of the reason I love them is because that was Gay's earring. And those were earrings that Gay loved. And I turned them into something that I love to wear, but still every time I see them, they remind me of her. This is a pair of earrings. It also has a funny, this one has a funny story. So this one, this pair of earrings used to be the other direction. I put the post behind these and they hung down and both of these wires were slick and shiny. Everything was slick and shiny. And I hated them. I just wouldn't wear them. I thought they were, they were adequate. That was it. So I decided I was either going to tear them apart or I was going to fix them. So what I did was to cut the post off the back here. I soldered the post onto the back here. These are brown diamonds, so they with, withstood being soldered on. I soldered the post on here, and then I took a stamp and I came in and I textured one of the wires, and I liked them much better. I think the contrast between having a textured wire and a not textured wire really shows things off. It just makes it, it gives it a lot more contrast. Otherwise, they just look like, I don't know, they look like something you'd buy at Nordstrom's for whatever. But I think they're much more interesting now. This is a ring. I want you to notice the back of this right here where it's textured. And then I want you to notice the high polished gold on the top. And what a nice contrast that is. It's even textured all the way around here, but the texture gets very, very light, almost none right here very light as it goes around, much more textured underneath here. So this next set, this is going long. This next set is um, some of Marnie Ryan's work and she does a lot of fusing with gold and silver together. And she makes these wires that look like this and she puts them on back plates and fuses them and then she makes them into things. I'm gonna show you some of these. I'm gonna go kind of fast with this. Um, so these are, these are pieces that she puts down. Sometimes she puts down sheet metal, sometimes, so this is wires on top of, of sheet. This is sheet on top of sheet, cut out little pieces. And then she puts it through the mill and then she does more and then she, um, anyway, I'll show you some more of her work in a little bit. This is one of mine. This is uh, fused, fused and heat, heat textured. I do want you again to notice the slick sides on this. So the inside, I like the inside of the rings to be really clean and, and uh, polished and slick. And a lot of times the edges are. So this is a wire that's really slick. This is an edge that's really slick. And yet this is very textured and oxidized. This is another one, same thing. And notice too, right here where the metal, the heat texture made the metal curl. Notice how this slick wire accents that coming up because it stops right there at an angle and really showcases the, um, the heat texture curl. How did you assemble that? Was it flat and then you, I mean, how did you do that one? Um, so when I do these, I always, uh, I do the heat texture when it's flat, okay? And then what I do is to figure out how they're gonna be rings. So I wrap it around and uh, figure out where it wraps around and what side it goes on and all that kind of stuff. So I figured that out, soldered this in next so that it makes it stable. That made the whole thing stable. And then I'm able to fit this and solder it because the wire is thicker, a lot thicker than, than the uh, sheet metal was. It's not, I can be a little bit sloppy with how it fits in there. Um, so it just kind of fit on the edge and I soldered it in and I'm pretty sure I'm not positive cause I don't remember for sure. But what I often do with this is I don't try to fit it as a partial band. I make a solid band that goes all the way around 
that fits really well. And then I solder it and then wherever it's open, I'll cut that away. So I cut that after the fact. It's easy and then I make sure that my seam, whatever my seam was for this is right there. Um, it's easier for me to solder a whole band on like that than it is to solder a partial one. And it's also easier to fit a whole band than to fit a partial one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This one was harder to fit. So this again is heat textured. Notice on this one, if you get really little heat texture, a lot of times it'll curl up like this. This piece, this outer piece here is a second band that was made after the fact. And it was because when I had the stone setting and the heat textured piece, it looked too plain and too ordinary and it was too empty in here. And I didn't want to do another stone and I didn't want to, I, I wasn't sure what to do. And so what I did was to bend this piece of metal to mostly fit. You can see there's a gap here, there's a gap here. So I bent it to mostly fit and it's soldered in three or four places. So it's probably soldered here. It's soldered over here. I think it's soldered back here. Uh, might be soldered over here. And, but it's got gaps all the way around as well. Uh, but it fits in well enough that it's, it's good. And it's also very highly polished. You know, that is a really, really cool piece. It looks like a woman who is like holding on to the stone. That is gorgeous. Thank you. I, I, I like this piece. I think it's a really interesting one. I tried the, the outer band, this band, in copper several times before I got it right, before I got what I wanted. Uh, and then I did it in silver. These are Marnie Ryan's. This is a lot of what she makes out of those um, sheets that she fuses. And you can see all the fused patterns. They're just gorgeous. This is some of the rings that she does. If you go on her website, look up Marnie Ryan. She has beautiful, beautiful work. These are just some samples that I wanted to show you. So this is heat texturing and you can see how the edges curl in like that. So the way that I get earrings, just FYI, is um, that I try to cut a whole bunch of similar size strips and then I fuse, all, or if don't fuse, I. Uh, heat texture all of them and then I match them up because sometimes they'll match and sometimes they won't. If you only do two, I guarantee they won't match. Um, I usually do 20 or 30 at a time and then I match them up and I'll end up with probably 10 to 12 pairs of earrings and then a whole bunch of single things. What gauge of metal is that? I do best with heat texturing 20 gauge. 20 is my go-to. Um, some people can do thinner and some people can do thicker. This is all 20 and that is my go-to metal for that. It's just, I get these beautiful edges. Look at these edges. Isn't that pretty right there? Look at this. I love those edges. Um, I get that with 20 and I can't get that as nicely with thinner or thicker. Um, some people probably can, but I can't. This is reticulated. This is what reticulation looks like. So are these. And you can see the difference. These are heat textured and hammer textured. So the gold is hammer textured, the silver is heat textured, they're soldered together. What silver do you use for your reticulation? I use 24 gauge and I use reticulation silver. I got it from, I've gotten it from Hauser and Miller and I've gotten it from Rio and both of them have been fine. Um, but I do use reticulation silver. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Say that, is there a difference or like a way to achieve the different um, textures in the reticulation? Like one was like very random and the other one was more linear almost? Yeah. Like, so let's go back. So this, this, this is a very small piece. This was like a one inch by one inch maybe. So it's a very small piece. So the heat in this one was right here. You can always tell where the heat is in the reticulation by the way it draws up. The heat was right here. Somebody put a little bit of heat here on the corner, but most of the heat was right here in the center and it made it draw up like that. On these, 
So this is some stuff that we got from Rio and we did this as a class. And I don't know if it was the way it was milled or if it was something else that created this linear texture. But again, they're very, very small pieces. So when it reticulated, it was the whole inside almost at once getting um, molten and the outside not. So the, because it did that and because it was probably a very large flame to do that so that it was the whole piece at once, it created the more linear textures like this. I, I might do one on reticulation and fusing and heat texture and the difference because it's, it is really fascinating, the difference. So this is heat texture. <clears throat> this is a heat textured piece. Um, this has hammer texture here, and then these pieces are heat textured. Deb? Would you say heat texture is right before it reticulates? I might have missed that at the beginning. No, 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 no. They're completely different things. Heat texture, you're melting the surface of the metal. You melt the surface, but not the bottom. And that's one reason, that's why the edges curl in like this. Okay, and on reticulation, you're melting the middle and not the top or the bottom. Um, what yeah. torch do you use to reticulate? What torch do you use to heat texture? I use an aerosetylene for both, but you can use almost any torch. It's just a matter of controlling the heat properly. What um, tip do you use? Depends on how big the piece is, but usually a number one. Thanks. Do you make your own setting for trillions or do you buy this? I buy them. I buy them from Stuller and sometimes I alter them a little bit, but I buy them. Partly because a lot of that work I'm selling and if I go into making the settings myself, that is another two or three hours on the piece and it's your time that really sucks up the money and then they're just unaffordable. Um, I'm, I don't like the more traditional settings. I like those big blocky settings and they are commercially available. If something's commercially available, I don't spend my time making it. So this is a heat textured piece right here. And look at these edges. I think they're just gorgeous. This is 20 gauge heat textured. This is gold, 14 karat gold on here. And uh, that's been hammer textured, just soldered on. Here's another view of it. This is a heat textured piece. Again, the bottom side has the solid, there, has a solid ring or solid uh, wire. This is carving. I've taught this several times in the studio and it's really fun to do. This is all done with burrs on either half round or low dome wire. Uh, but look at the textures. Oh my gosh, how rich is that? And you, there's no reason it has to be done just on wire like this. There's no reason that you can't do it on, um, on either sheet or other wire. So this is one of the carved rings. And then this is a ring that uh, Lee Holtzman made and it's done in the charity hall fashion or the other one that I showed you where you have the little, um, the little tabs coming up and over to hold it in. I just think these two complement each other really nicely. And the texture, the complementing texture on them I think is really rich and really beautiful. This is done with a checkering file. This is, so this is Elise's favorite ring and she loves to wear these, but because she wears it all the time and silver is so soft, she um, often either breaks it or uh, completely wears it slick and then sends it back to me and I retexture or make her a new one. This is a, some of them, I think last time I made her two of them. Uh, and then that's just a checkering file and then the other one is carved. Look at the hammer texture on this. Isn't that gorgeous? And look how by having a slight texture here, but having it basically smooth and slick versus this little texture, it's just really nice. This is another one. So this is likely um, fusing 
of, of um, filings. This is a heat textured piece. And this was, Lee made this, Lee Holtzman. This is the silver dust fused on. I don't know how this one was done, but I, if I had done this, it would be roller printed with paper and overlapping paper and maybe multiple times. This one, I wanted, so the, this is roller printed with paper, I'm sure. This could be roller printed with paper and could be hammer marks in addition to that. But I wanted you to see the texture and how the texture, how she used it as the tree cutouts and how beautiful that is. This, it's obviously birch, right? They're birch trees. These are likely cast. I doubt that they're fabricated, although they could be fabricated. But look at the very coarse filing that's left on there versus this very smooth area. I think those are really beautiful. The, the, I'm sure they're rings, but I want them to be bracelets. I think that's, oh, one more. So this one, the gold, again, very slick, channel set diamonds. Look at this. Look at this as it comes around in this really rich texture. That's it. Okay, so that was a really long slideshow. Sorry, guys. Um, but like I said, it was 300 slides and I pared it down a lot. Uh, does anybody have any questions about texturing and textures and what the possibilities are? Where do you get bimetal? Uh, Hauser and Miller sells it, Reactive Metals sells it, and you can make it yourself. Thank you. Dev, I want to show what I have doing with cuttlefish. Oh, cuttlefish casting is wonderful. That makes beautiful, beautiful textures. Um, what yeah. I am, I'm sorry, what I am practicing is doing my texture on the cuttlefish. Nice, nice. Can you see how it looks? I can't see you. We'll get it in a sec, Maribel. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I will send it to you, you will see it because I have been practices with that and, and it's beautiful making ring. Yeah, so mm -hmm. casting is a whole nother one as far as, especially direct casting. So cuttlefish casting, that kind of thing leaves wonderful textures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so fun textures on there. Where, where do you find a checkering file? Um, Auto Fry. Thank you. Auto Fry has them. Contente has them. I believe Stuller has them. Uh, they come in different, different coarsenesses from a double zero to a four or so um, and different widths. So you can get all kinds of different ones. They're not inexpensive files. So you need to kind of know what you're after uh, before you go buy them because you won't want to buy a lot of them. Uh, but they're really cool files to have. Do you, do you have a, an assortment or do you have a favorite one? There is a YouTube video that's up on, it's up on YouTube. There's one of the videos that is on filing and finishing. And I do talk about checkering files and I show some of the differences. So you can Thanks. see there. Mm -hmm. Deb, I have another question. Yeah. Um, about your reticulation. And I understood that you could only reticulate with the Smith Little Torch and you use an acetylene, so I would be very much appreciative if you did a lesson on that somehow. <laughs> well, I, so a lot of people will use a hotter torch like that, but I don't. Um, and there's no reason that you need to use a little torch at all to do reticulation. I, everybody in the, the class, we all did it with the, the regular silversmith and it works just fine. All you need to do is to be able to melt the silver on the inside. So the silversmith does that just fine. You don't need a little torch. Um, but yeah, I can talk about that at a, another time. I've already gone way over today. 
Anything else? Deb? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you were talking about heat texturing the brass, yeah. Um, so you're saying you, you need to bring up the copper layer first? Right, and it's red brass, not yellow brass. Yellow brass won't do it, red brass does. Okay, so you're just like heating and cooling and heating and cooling a bunch of times? Well, no, no. You have to heat it up and then let it cool, put it in the pickle, that's key, and then burnish it back down. So you scrub it with a brass brush or steel wool, and then you do it again. So you do that three or four times so that you get a nice copper layer on there. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then it's pretty high heat to melt that, that brass inside. Deb, I have a question. Uh-huh. When you are fusing the gold or silver dust um, to your metal, are you using a flux? Are you using prips or none? Um, I usually use a spray flux like a prips or, um, or uh, cupronil or something like that, but one of the... the one of the liquidy fluxes to do that. And you bring the metal, the heat of the metal up first before you put the uh, silver dust on? I usually do. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for joining me today for this session of Studio Time with Deb. And I hope to see you next week. Thank you.